Welcome to a sneak peek of what we're working on here at White Coat Coaching. This is a preview of our orthopedic jumpstart course. If you like what you see here, stay tuned to the end of the video and we'll give you some further instructions. So when most people think about orthopedics, they think about fractures. So let's move to the intro to trauma. Just an overview of the questions we'll be talking about today. What are the different ways that fractures heal? What are the ways that we can influence how a particular bone heals? And is one better than the other? These are kind of big picture questions to keep in mind as we move through some of the details. So let's talk about the ways that bones heal. There are two main ways. We have indirect healing or secondary healing. And the other is direct healing, also known as primary healing, which you can also think about as remodeling. We'll start with indirect healing, also known as secondary healing, because historically, this is how most fractures healed. Step one, after your fracture, you have an inflammatory phase where a hematoma forms around the fracture. You've got vasodilation of the surrounding tissues, which allows blood and other helpful things like cytokines and macrophages to be recruited into the area. After a week or two, you have the formation of soft callus. Osteoblasts come in and create the soft callus, which essentially increases the stability of the area. However, this is a soft callus and it can still bend, although your length is a little more stable. Next, we've got hard callus. This is where the soft callus transitions to woven bone, and this happens from the outside in. This decreases the amount of strain in the area, which helps you remodel bone. The last and final phase of healing is the remodeling phase, and this is where you transition from woven bone to lamellar bone. And this is a long process that can take years. Uh, this happens a lot in kids. So you might see a huge callus formation and then take an extra a couple years later and the bone looks as if it was never broken. The other type of healing, direct healing or primary healing, is essentially your normal bone metabolic process. Uh, this involves osteoblasts and osteoclasts and the cutting cones that happens in response to any sort of stress in your bone. This happens now, even without a fracture. As your bone loads certain areas, it stimulates your body to lay down more bone in the stimulated areas and less bones where you don't need it. Um, this picture is to demonstrate that when you have primary bone healing, you don't have any callus. And we'll go get to the question marks a little later. Now, two important uh, concepts here. We've got stress, uh, which is defined as force per unit area, and strain, which is a relative measure. So you're measuring the amount of deformation of an object that happens um, with any sort of stress. So our little osteoblast, osteocyte, excuse me, osteocyte here, if he is between two ends of the fracture or the fracture gap, there's a certain amount of strain that he can tolerate. However, if there's too much strain, he will not be able to mature into bone. So can we influence what type of healing we get? And the answer is yes. So naturally, there's a, a different level of stability. If you look on the left here, we've got stability increasing from the least amount of stability here at the bottom, or unstable, moving all the way to the top, where we have absolute stability. If we have absolute stability, there's very little movement um, and very low strain, less than 2%. This will allow for direct or primary healing and requires compression. If you're somewhere in the middle though, say in the relative stability area, uh, between two and 10% uh, strain, you'll achieve indirect or secondary healing. And this will require splinting and bridging. So if you think about um, hundreds of years ago, someone went hunting and fell, uh, tripped on a rock and broke their leg. They would wrap 
something around their leg to make it a little more stable. They definitely would not be able to achieve absolute stability, but instead would have relative stability, and they would go through that indirect healing process that we talked about earlier. So let's break this down a little bit more. For absolute stability and uh, primary healing, there's two main types. You've got the static, which implies that it's built into the construct that we'll put on it to help the bone heal, which includes lagging and compression plating, or dynamic, which means that you need the body's movement in order to convert to compression. If we go to the relative, there's the non-op, classic uh, stick wrapped around the leg, or we've got more advanced casting and functional bracing now. In the operative realm, we've got a whole uh, gamut of things that we can use. We've got intramedullary splinting, extramedullary splinting, splinting, and X-fix. Of course, on the bottom, if you cannot uh, stabilize the bone enough, it will never heal. So let us start at the top of this chart with direct or primary healing. So there's a couple of things that we need to achieve in order to get this primary healing. We'll need to have absolute stability, little to no movement at the fracture, interfragmentary compression, meaning that the pieces need to touch and be compressed against each other, and anatomic reduction. Everything needs to be uh, where it should be. This is good for areas that you would need predictable healing and better vascularization. Uh, predictable healing is especially important when you're talking about an um, intraarticular fracture. You wouldn't want a large callus forming to ruin the congruity of your joint. Better vascularization, that's important in fractures with tenuous blood supply. Uh, think your scaphoid fractures. Next, let's look in our toolbox. Let's look a little more closely at the anatomy of a screw. So starting on the left, you've got the head of your screw, which comes in locking and non-locking uh, variations. We'll look a little bit closer at that later. The pitch is the distance between threads. Uh, this will be a longer distance in cancellous screws and shorter in cortical screws. Cancellous, uh, bone is a little less dense and so the longer pitch or the larger pitch will help with uh, pull out strength. Uh, looking at the tip you have several options. You can have self-cutting and self-tapping which will cut down on the steps in inserting the screw. Now if you look at the diameter of a screw we've got two highlighted here. The smaller diameter is the core diameter and this is mostly where uh, your bending strength will play. Outer diameter is uh, the diameter of the entire screw. And this will relate to your pullout strength, um, as well as usually this is the name of the size of the screw. All right, so let's talk about compression, our static compression. Uh, one common way that this is achieved is through lagging. Now, lagging can be done two ways. You can lag by technique or lag by design. So the top row here is going through lagging by technique. So your first step here, this line indicates our fracture. Your gliding or your near hole will be drilled first, and this is the outer diameter of the screw. So if you were to insert the screw, there would be no purchase here. This should be perpendicular to the fracture line. Next step is to drill your threaded or far hole, and this is the core diameter, still perpendicular to the fracture. Next, plus or minus, countersink. And so this is to increase the amount of surface area that the head will have to uh, apply force and decrease the point stress uh, on the surface, on the cortex of the bone here. Last step is to insert your screw. And you can see here that there would be no purchase here in the near or near hole, which would allow it to glide. But as it goes through to the far hole, uh, the threads will get some purchase and then compress the bone between the head of the screw and the threads that are engaging here. 
lagging by design, you can have a partially threaded screw and you can see that it does a very similar thing. This area won't have any purchase and it will essentially glide through that area while the threads on this side uh, will grab the cortex and pull and compress against the head of the screw. Now it's important when you're using a partially threaded screw that the screws, sorry, that the threads don't cross the fracture line because if they do then you are just uh, putting in a positional screw which holds the fracture in place but doesn't compress the two ends together. Um, examples where you might use a um, partially threaded screw would be a scaphoid fracture. You can use a cannulated partially threaded screw which will help you insert it in the right direction. Uh, and without stripping all the soft tissues off. Some of the bad things or disadvantages with lagging is that it does not resist bending and shear forces very well. So uh, if you take a classic distal fibula fracture, as an example, if it is the right pattern, you can put in a lag screw, but you can't trust the lag screw to hold everything together. That's the most important screw because it provides the compression and allows for the primary healing, but you'll have to uh, add a neutralization plate, often a one-third tubular plate that will resist the other forces, the bending and the shear forces. Now, another way you can achieve compression is through a plate. Um, dynamic compression plating is what is illustrated here. Let's say that we have set the plate on and it is screwed attached on one side of the fracture. Now if you look carefully here at the sides of the screw hole, um, you can see that we've drilled away from the fracture. So this is an eccentrically drilled hole away from the fracture. And as you insert the screw and it begins to purchase the bone on either side, the shape of the screw head and the um, hole will allow for the screw to slide to the middle. So as it slides to the middle of the hole, slides to the center of the hole, it will take the bone that it has purchased and compress it against the other side. Limited contact here is just to say that many of the more modern plates have scalloping on the edge uh, on the bone plate interface to limit the amount of contact that you have here uh, to uh, decrease the amount of periosteal damage. Now these are two examples of dynamic compression. Tension band technique is classically used in the patella as well as in olecranon fractures. And the idea here is that you're converting the functional tension of an area uh, into compression. So if you look at our little picture of the patella here with the quad muscle, quad tendon, if you use your extensor mechanism, you're going to have tension, but the construct of the tension band converts that tension across the anterior aspect to compression across the articular surface where you really want that primary healing. Another example of dynamic compression is buttress plating. So this is a uh, tibial plateau fracture. If you use buttress plating here, if you look at where the stress would be coming in, if you were to stand on this, it would be here, which would then be converted by the plate into interfragmentary compression. Now the most, most important screw here is this screw in the axilla. So we move down the chart, away from the direct and primary healing into indirect or secondary healing. Now this type of healing needs um, are different. Relative stability is what we need uh, and you can provide this with bridging or splinting constructs. Now the good things about indirect or secondary healing is you do not need an anatomic reduction. Um, so for certain areas that an anatomic reduction is not as important, often shaft fractures, you just need to have functional reduction. Um, this way you can decrease the amount of soft tissue destruction you would need to do. This is also very good for comminuted fractures. Um, if you think back to our picture before, if you had several osteocytes and several gaps, um, this would kind of share the amount of strain that you would have across each 
uh, fracture gap, allowing you to have a little bit more movement between each fracture, with, between each fragment, without causing each osteocyte to fail. So this illustration shows many, uh, some of the many ways that you can achieve splinting or bridging. So let's start on the very left. We've got our external fixator. This comes in many flavors. You can have mono, uh, planar, biplanar, multiplanar uh, X fixes. And you could see how this would uh, provide relative stability. Um, some really cool ones are circular frames, which are used for uh, some major deformities or even leg length, uh, lower extremity deformities in kids. Moving over one, we've got this standard bridge plate. Uh, this is a contoured plate. Many of the different companies have ones made for many different bones, kind of averaging the anatomic shapes and building them off of that. Now with these, um, the plates are held on with friction, so there's a fair amount of periosteal damage done here, as depicted by our unhappy uh, smiley face. Next, we've got internal extramedullary splinting. Um, with the development of locked, locked screws, we were able to develop these plates that didn't necessarily need to sit down directly on the bone. They didn't rely on friction as much as the other ones did. Once these screws locked into the plate, they became fixed angle constructs and almost the same idea as an external fixator, but you're able to place it a, a lot closer to the bone, creating more stability. Next, we've got intramedullary fixation. Um, intramedullary nails here, you are uh, creating a much more biologically friendly construct because you don't have to strip away the soft tissues. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about those locking screws that I had mentioned earlier. If you look at these detailed pictures, you can see that uh, the head of the screw has threads. So it's not just here, but here in the head of the screw you have threads which correspond with threads in the plate. So as you insert the screw, these lock together, um, they engage with, you, with each other and they become fixed angle constructs. So it's as if you had inserted um, a process, uh, hardware that was this shape to begin with. And this significantly increases your pullout strength. And this kind of shows you how. So in a classic plate, um, you have failure in sequence. If you were to take this plate and rock it back and forth as though you had a lot of motion, the screws would eventually work themselves free in sequence and you would see the plate lifting off from here. This would fail, then the next one, then the next one. However, if you have locking screws, these are fixed angle constructs and they will not toggle back and forth. So if this were to fail, the whole thing would need to pull out all at once. Uh, this is especially good for osteoporotic bone because if you were to imagine this happening in poor bone, it'd be a lot easier to uh, shake it loose one at a time. This requires all of them to fail at once and pull straight out. Now if we talk a little bit about um, intramedullary nails, you might hear a lot of dynamically or statically locked. If we go back to um, our splinting one, for example, uh, femur shaft fractures, gold standard, is reamed locked nails. So let's look at this one. Let's pretend that this is uh, your AP. You can see that you've got two screws going through distally. Let's look at it a little more closely. Here's our fracture. Here's our nail. You'll see that this hole is filled with a screw and this would mean that it is statically locked. If you look at the elongated or elliptical hole at the bottom there, you have the option of dynamically locking or statically locking the screw. So if you put the, sorry, this nail, if you put the screw in the more distal portion away from the fracture, this is called dynamically locking it. As long as this is in there though, however, it is statically locked. Remember that at the proximal end of this nail, you have, uh, it's locked as well. 
say this person goes on to non-union and you think it's because it is too stiff there's not enough movement there's not enough relative instability here to promote that callus formation and healing process um, you could dynamize the nail and what that means is that you remove this screw this statically locking screw which will allow the nail then to move on this so imagine that you take a step and this will allow this proximal segment because you're no longer statically locked to descend and apply some compression across the fracture site this may be enough stimulation for the bone to start that healing process a little better. So, which type of healing is better? And it really depends. So, this requires a little bit of history. The history of the AO, I cannot pronounce that. So, it is um, Austrian for Association for the Study of Internal Fixation. So classically, everything healed with indirect healing, and when people would follow them with x-rays, they would see large amounts of callus formation, and that would be the classic way of healing. However, they began to uh, experiment with different ways of fixation, and they uh, were able to, with absolute stability, induce healing without any callus formation. So here we've got a fracture, we've got a lag screw across the fracture, um, and you can see that there's no callus around the healing. And at first, that was very puzzling to them, and it became a goal for them. So for a while, everyone was trying to get absolute healing. But eventually, we understood that that's not necessarily better, and they developed the following principles. So here are the AO principles of fracture care. Fracture reduction and fixation to restore anatomical relationships, which if you think about a uh, femur shaft fracture, it's not necessary that everything is put back in exactly the same place. The things that are, are important are rotation, alignment, and length. You want the leg to be the same length. You want the foot to be pointing in the right direction. Um, and you want the alignment when you're putting weight on your leg uh, to be such that you don't ruin your knees or your ankles or anything distal to that. Number two, fracture fixation providing absolute or relative stability as the personality of the fracture, the patient, and the injury requires. Um, so let's think about that a little bit more. Who knew that bones had personalities or fractures had personalities? So what does that really mean? It's basically touching on two characteristics of each fracture. What is the biology of that particular bone and the fracture pattern? So think about your blood supply. Um, areas that have tenuous blood supply, let's take the scaphoid for example, um, the area that is fractured will definitely um, influence the amount of blood supply to the area. Another good fracture to think about is your femoral neck fracture. Um, if it's di displaced or non-displaced, will definitely uh, influence the amount of blood supply to the area. Next, you have stability. So, what is the inherent stability of the fracture pattern? For example, think about a distal radius fracture. If it's extra articular and it's perched on the cortex, it's probably pretty inherently stable. However, if you've got a volar barton and a piece of that a uh, distal radius articular surface is broken off, the pull of the flexor tendons will inherently pull the carpus off of the distal radius. Anatomy is also pretty important. If you think about the proximal humerus fractures, you can accept much less in your greater tuberosity displacement because it'll get in the way of your arm abduction when it heals, if it heals wrong. Now, comminution is also important to think about. Um, if it's severely comminuted, obviously, you will not be able to achieve anatomic reduction and direct healing with absolute stability. So these uh, characteristics are what you want to think about when looking at the different classifications. And there are a lot of classifications. What makes a good classification? So a couple of things make good classifications, including 
inter and intra observer reliability. If two people look at an x-ray and can't agree on what class it is, it's probably not a very good classification. Uh, it also should help you determine your treatment protocol. So here is by no means an exhaustive list of the different classifications out there. It may seem like rote memorization at times, but if you keep in mind the idea of why we have these classifications, sometimes it makes it easier for you to remember. So the OA, sorry, the AO and the OTA have come together to develop um, a more encompassing fracture classification system. Most of the other ones, well, all of the other ones are looking primarily at um, each particular area. The Evans classification for intertrope fractures, uh, Fernandez for distal radius, such and such. However, the AO and OTA have tried to come up with a classification system, uh, particularly for long bone fractures, that describe it for each bone. So here we've got a AO 33C2. So the first number depicts uh, which bone. We've got one for the humerus, two for the forearm, three for the femur, and four for the tibia. So this is a femur, we've got a three. The next number is for where it is. You've got proximal, diaphyseal, and distal. This being the distal femur is another three. Um, and then the type in the class, C2. So looking at this fracture, what how would you treat this fracture, taking into consideration uh, the personality um, and different ways the bone heals and different ways that we can influence the healing? So the most distal part, we've got articular fracture. This area will need to heal anatomically in order for this knee to um, to heal well enough not to have a ton of post-traumatic arthritis. To heal without callus, we need to have absolute stability to induce primary healing. In order to achieve absolute stability, we'll need to have compression. And so here you can see partially threaded screws, which is essentially lagging by design. We are going to have interfragmentary compression here to achieve um, absolute stability for primary healing. What about this part of the fracture? So here we've got an intramedullary nail. The characteristics of this particular fracture area is a little bit different. So we're gonna use this intramedullary nail um, as a splinting device to achieve relative stability so that we can induce secondary healing. So this is a diap, well, metaphyseal and diaphyseal comminuted fractures and so we just need functional reduction and secondary healing. Robust callus formation here would not be bad. So in conclusion the two things um, that I want you to remember are biology and stability. So basically whenever we fix fractures we are just providing an environment for the bone to heal itself. No matter how fancy or how expensive our fixation devices are, if the bone does not heal, all hardware will eventually fail. Thanks for watching our preview of what we have uh, going at White Coat Coaching. Who are we? We are you, maybe three years from now. We're working really hard to lift the veil of how to apply. We want to help you make good goals and also to achieve them. Coming soon, we're going to have the opportunity to get pre-release access to the course. This will help us because we'll be able to get some feedback from you, but you'll also be able to take advantage of some promotional pricing. Email us at admin at whitecoatcoaching.com if you're interested. Remember to follow us on the social medias. Follow us on Instagram for x-ray reading tips and OR tips. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel.